thank you for um, having the chance to give a presentation here. Uh, thanks for the organizers for having brought us together and um, to point out that this is joint work with my colleague from Karlsruhe, Günter Last, and with Matthias Schulte, who spent some years in Karlsruhe, but is now at the University of Hamburg, Harburg. So you see in the title Boolean models, um, which may be in, uh, some concept known to some of you, but maybe not uh, most of you. So I will give a very gentle introduction with plenty of pictures in the very beginning. And our robotic space has been mentioned before, um, um, just two days or yesterday, I think. Um, and um, two weeks ago, it was the topic of a seminar talk. But I will give a gentle introduction to what I need as well. Uh, before I do that, um, let me start with a first advertisement of a, of a very applied, um, but also with a um, theoretical background, uh, workshop on stochastic geometry, stereology, and image analysis. Here you can see the um, main speakers, plenary speakers, and we are looking forward to an um, interesting workshop in Bad Herrenalp. So the registration is open and you can check the web page if you wish. There will be another advertisement at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I promised to introduce uh, what a Boolean model is from an applied point of view. And if you are at an institute like Karlsruhe uh, with a lot of engineers, um, they um, can easily show you, for instance, the geologist the porous structures like that one where you see a lot of holes of different sizes and distribution. Um, some of the holes may have merged into a larger hole, and you can only see the union of these smaller ones, um, which are now forming the larger one. So that's just one piece of lava rock. Here's another one, which I got from the internet, um, which shows um, pores in um, cement. Um, which are arising in the construction process by some um, chemical reactions. And here the same kind of picture is um, seen with larger holes and smaller holes distributed and scattered over the plane. But this is just a section plane. So the whole thing is three-dimensional and um, if you do imaging, and I will show you another picture later on, then you slice the object, look at the slices, and from several slides, you try to reconstruct the three-dimensional object. So here's a, a nice picture from a sunny day here in Bonn, uh, which I took from the Botanical Garden. So the copyright is due to me. And here again, you see smaller, um, um, let's say, particles. These are these leaves, um, and they overlap. And in some sense, you could imagine that after some imaging tools applied to this picture, you only see the union set, no longer the individual boundaries. And that's quite typical if you go to micro and nanostructures in science, then you only see pixelized information and then you can't recognize the individual grain boundaries. Right? So that's a simulation from an older paper by people who work in applied science, like Tristonia Soja and Joachim Rosa, and they used a simulation of a Boolean model of Balls, you can see the white parts are obtained by taking unions of random spheres in the plane, and they were um, chosen in this way to simulate a pot potassium deposits. And um, once you have such simulations, you can compare them to real pictures and adjust the parameters of the simulation. So here this is a much more recent um, um, field emission scanning electron microscope um, information you get after slicing this block, which is on a nanometer scale, and look at the slices with different techniques, which are indicated by these abbreviations. And here the, um, the information, you just see the union. You can't recognize individual uh, boundaries from the box. Here's a, um, a simulation uh, where you can uh, guess that the individual particles which were underlying the construction were all ellipses but with different aspect ratios, different sizes. And um, so here a natural question could be, is there water flowing through the white area? 
And that's a question of calculation theory in some sense. Um, here's the, the final picture, which I mainly took um, to indicate um, something which is used for modeling Boolean models. So these are blood cells of frog, frogs. Couldn't be human um, blood cells, as I learned, because uh, frogs have nuclei in the center, humans don't. And um, here you can still, to some extent, see the, um, the boundaries of the individual um, cells, which are ellipse-like, but not clearly. And this is still a very good picture, right? Okay, here's some literature, just to um, tell you that the whole story of studying Boolean models started with work of Georges Matheron from the French school, um, geology school, and Fontainebleau. He wrote a book which was very influential and also coined the name. And there's um, some other books by um, Jean Serra um, on image analysis, Peter Hall on coverage processes, people working in statistics, spatial statistics, like um, Rassi and Molchanov. Um, but also in the book by Meisters and Roy on continuum calculation, the Boolean model plays a major role. Um, uh, if I may recommend a book for first check, that's the one by Stoyan, Kendall, and Mecke, and in the final edition, um, Chio became uh, another author, so that's why it's in brackets. And uh, of course, um, the state of the art up to 2008 is nicely presented in the book by Wolf Schneider and Wolfgang Weil, but um, since then, a lot has happened, actually, um, because at the point when the book was written, we essentially only had mean value information about Boolean models. I will explain more clearly what I mean by that. And variances and limit theorems were out of scope. And it came with um, work of uh, Matthias Reisner, Matthias Schulte in his PhD thesis, where all this started, but also Fock space expansions by other people like Günther, Matthew Penrose, and um, of course Giovanni Piccardi and collaborators contributed a lot. So here, um, if you remember the frog picture um, with the cells, you saw the nuclei, and let's suppose um, these are the nuclei, and they are modeled by a Poisson process in space. And here are the plane, and the Poisson process could be homogeneous, which means um, the um, um, distribution is proportional to um, the back measure, and the constant of proportionality is called the intensity tells you how dense the points lie in space in a, say, in an area of unit um, volume. But you could also have an unisotropic Poisson process, then you have an, um, just some locally finite measure in space. So now um, we are doing the following. Um, with each of the points, we attach a particle. And the particles are taken from some particle shape distribution, and the individual particles are independent of the points and independent of each other. And after that, you get a picture like that. And this is called the Poisson particle process if you consider the collection of all these particles in space. And the final step is take the union set. That's what you see on a, on a, on a microscopic picture. And here, because the geometry is, is very um, simple, or the shapes are just congruent um, rectangles, you might not have a hard time to recognize each of the particles still, but there could be one particle hidden in between which you can't see, you overlap. So the question is, can you still reconstruct the information about the intensity of the point process and the distribution of the shapes just looking at the union set? That's the, the main question and the task, because in engineering, you just see the picture, you can do measurements on that, and want to get information about the underlying um, distributions, so the point process and the, the shapes. So that's the philosophy. Gain information about intensity, or in the inhomogeneous case, which is much harder, intensity measure, um, and the shape distribution for measurements on the right-hand side. And the classical approach for that, which goes back to work of Miles and Davy, thesis by Davy, um, 
is the following um, establish relations between measure, mean values of measurements on the right hand side and mean values of the particle distribution, which you can't see, and then invert somehow these relationships. And uh, mean value information was actually, as I said before, um, essentially all one could do in this business up to the um, 2010, something like that. Okay, um, so here's a brief summary. Um, so Boolean models have been started a lot in Euclidean space from both a theoretical and um, an applied point of view. And you can um, adopt different degrees of generality in your study, as I pointed out already. And after the work of Miles and David took quite some time um, until when um, more advanced information about variances, uh, asymptotic variances and center limit theorems could be obtained. And they um, relied on, on previous work, um, as I already said. And the Boolean model can be constructed, as I indicated just by the picture, by starting from a Poisson process of points in some space, a Euclidean space, and attaching to the points independently and independently of each other random shapes, and then taking the union set. That's one approach, and this um, is very um, convenient because it's intuitive. But what you could also do is you start with a Poisson process in an abstract space of particles, and then just take the union of such a Poisson process. Both approaches are mathematically um, equivalent, but um, the applied people prefer the first one. And in Euclidean space, um, the transition between the two is easy. In hyperbolic space, it's not clear. And therefore, we will prefer the second approach. Um, it's often said that the Boolean model is simple because the Poisson assumptions, which is underlying it, um, because Poisson means you have some independence, you have a nice distribution you can work with, fast decay, um, in some sense. Um, but that's why you compare if you see something um, else, which might not be um, coming from, from the Boolean model, with the Boolean model. Also, it's, um, it's um, used in calculation theory, and um, it's one of the, the main um, models in stochastic geometry. Perhaps others are random graphs, um, tessellations, random fields, um, so that's just a couple of others. So um, why should we study um, um, Boolean models in hyperbolic space? And if you are ever asked and should answer, here are three suggestions. Um, so what we ex um, observed um, a couple of years ago in joint work uh, with um, my former PhD student, um, Felix Herold and Christoph Taylor, and then also with Karina Bethken, and there are some other work by Daniel Bosen and Sacha Kadushko, which continued this, and is that in um, hyperbolic space, and considering, um, say, not Boolean models, but um, random flats and their intersections, completely new phenomena arose as compared to the Euclidean space. For instance, um, the asymptotics um, somehow do not lead to a central limit theorem, whereas in Euclidean space we have that. And the answer also depends on the dimension of the space, whether you get a central limit theorem or something else. And that's, that's appealing to a mathematician and um, should raise your curiosity to, to understand why this is the case. Um, also, we learned um, two weeks ago in a nice seminar talk um, that hyperbolic structures are omnipresent in geometry, in the uh, classification of surfaces and, um, and graph theory. And after all, it's just fun to, to understand the situation in a, in a different setting where you don't have scaling properties, which are very convenient um, in Euclidean space. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's some answers, and maybe you find others for yourself. So um, let's start with the mathematic, mathematics part. And, um, so I will give some hints to what hyperbolic geometry is and what are models of hyperbolic space, or essentially just one of the models 
namely the Planck high disk model, which is used here. But um, abstractly speaking, you could say a um, d-dimensional hyperbolic space is a d-dimensional Riemannian manifold, which is simply connected and has constant sectional curvature minus one z. Um, so in some sense, having this abstract description is convenient because once you have a result established in some model and it's invariantly formulated, um, it holds in general, and then you can, for instance, a switch to another model where some answers are easier to attain. So what you can see here is a, is a line, it's a geodesic, the shortest distance between points in, in some model, namely the unit ball model of hyperbolic space. Um, if the line passes through um, the center, the Euclidean center of this ball, uh, then um, the geodesics are segments, but the other geodesics are circles or spheres intersecting the boundary sphere orthogonally. So here you see also some apparent um, difference from the Euclidean setting. So this is a ball, a geodesic ball in hyperbolic space. This is another one. And what you observe is that the center is not the Euclidean center, but it's shifted towards the boundary as the ball gets closer to the boundary of the space. And what we consider um, are compact convex subsets of um, hyperbolic space. It's clear a compact, what a compact set is, a convex set is one for which each pair of points and the geodesic connecting them is contained in the set. And all kinds of uh, convexity which are usually different in remaining spaces coincide in hyperbolic space. Um, then we need the group of isometries um, of hyperbolic space, so distance-preserving maps and the Haar measure on it, because this is a topological, nice topological group, there's a Haar measure on it, and it can be related to the Haustoff measure, which is just based on the notion of distance. If you have a distance, and in, in hyperbolic space you have a distance, intrinsic distance function, you can um, define the Haustoff measure based on it, and, and the, that's the same as the Riemannian measure you get from the Riemannian metric, but it can also be described by using um, the Haar measure on the isometries by fixing some point and integrating over all isometries for which um, the image of x under O falls into a given Borel set. Both sides define locally finite isometry invariant measures, so they must coincide up to constant, and you use this constant to normalize the measure lambda. Right? Okay, um, that's one piece of information that will be useful. Another one are, um, are balls in hyperbolic space, which you have already seen, and their limits. So we fix a point um, in hyperbolic space, usually in, in the Poincaré ball model, that's the center of the Euclidean ball, and um, denote by B sub R, um, ball centered at P of radius R, and then uh, what is well known, I guess, is that the surface area of this ball is proportional to the sine hyperbolicus to some power. And the volume is the integral of this function over um, the, this range from zero to the radius, and omega d is the Euclidean surface area um, of a unit ball in, in RD. So having defined these two, um, you realized uh, that there is a striking difference to Euclidean space, which causes a lot of problems. Namely, if you take the ratio of the two, then and let r go to infinity, then in Euclidean space this would, would go to zero like one over r. Not so in hyperbolic space, and you see easily by L'Hopital's rule this goes to d minus one. And actually, this is not a, just a property of the balls. If you have any convex body k and take the ratio of the boundary of the, of the boundary surface and the volume, this is always greater than d minus one, as shown by um, Gallego and Solanus. And only the limit um, d minus 1 is attained. Okay, um, now what are horror balls? Let's start with the Euclidean situation. Let's say this is the origin. We go into a direction, a u, a certain distance, and um, then add r, and, and um, have a ball of radius r around this point. Then you increase um, r 
and get a sequence of balls all passing to the same point here. And in the limit, you get the tangent hyperplane through this point. Right? That's, that's quite elementary. <coughs> what is the situation in hyperbolic space? If you do the same, um, you go into some direction <coughs> rule, some distance t plus r, there's a fixed t, and have a ball of radius r around this, this point. And then you increase r. And what you get um, are sequences of balls with centers lying ever closer to the boundary. And in the limit, you get what is called a horror ball, a limiting um, sphere or limiting ball. And the um, tangent hyperplane, which is a totally geodesic submanifold passing through this, is indicated here. So here, more formally, um, if you um, start from some point, like the, the point P, the origin of your hyperbolic space, which is not having the same um, role as the Euclidean origin, for various reasons, it's just arbitrarily fixed. And you choose a unit vector in the tangent space uh, and take the exponential map to get to a point in the space um, in this way. Um, then the ball of radius R around um, this point as a limit, as r goes to infinity, and that's what we call um, this red hover ball. That's determined by two parameters, the vector u in the tangent space and the distance, the sine distance t. Okay, now we define Boolean models in hyperbolic space, and um, you see the illustration here in the Poincaré um, disk model. As I said, it's more convenient and natural, perhaps, in hyperbolic space not to start with a point process and then attach independently balls because this attaching is the problem. In Euclidean space, you can't just take a unique translation. But in hyperbolic space, what is a unique translation? It's, you can define something like that, but um, it's not so natural, perhaps. And the translations, in this sense, do not form a group, and that's why we proceed differently. So let's say we have a some process of compact convex sets in hyperbolic space. And we assume that this Poisson process is um, stationary, meaning um, isometry invariant. The distribution is isometry invariant. You can imagine it as a collection of particles, of random particles, uh, where you can still identify the individual particles, as you can see here um, by the black um, boundaries of the individual balls, or you can, which is formally nicer, um, interpret it as a random counting measure. That's some, sometimes technically easier. And then um, we take the mean value of this, this object. So that's a, it's a measure on the space of compact convex bodies, which, due to the stationarity assumption, is isometry invariant. So it's a deterministic measure now, which is isometry invariant and lives on the space of convex bodies, so Borel sets of convex bodies. So here, um, that's a notation for saying that this measure lambda is isometry invariant. And once we have the collection eta um, of the particles, we can take the union set. That's the Boolean model, stationary Boolean model in hyperbolic space. And now here, you just see the union set and nobody could tell whether there are balls inside and how many, and whether these are balls or ellipsoids, for instance. So what um, one does, if you recall um, the approach which has been uh, suggested by many people, also practitioners, is to study the Boolean model by just observing it in some window, W, um, which could be a ball of radius R, and then um, apply some functional, like the volume, or the boundary length, or the Euler characteristic, or some intrinsic volume, or whatever you find appropriate for your studies. Um, apply it, and hope that you can measure this information from the picture, and do some mathematics to get corresponding information about um, the intensity or the shape, shapes of the individual particles. So that's the, um, um, the strategy one usually, which really takes, and for this we needs, one needs these mean value, invariance, and asymptotic information.
And that's what we discuss in this talk. So um, formally, um, the starting point is that we have um, the, the Poisson process from which we get um, the intensity measure lambda. And actually, um, more challenging than starting from the Poisson process, we could start from any particle process. You don't need a Poisson assumption. And if you have then um, its intensity measure, which is a locally finite measure on the space of convex bodies in hyperbolic space, and require this to be locally finite, meaning that the set of convex bodies hitting a compact test set has finite measure, um, then you can already do a structural decomposition of this measure lambda, uh, if, if you know that this lambda is um, isometry invariant. And that's similar, but in details it's different from Euclidean space. So let's say we take a center function on the space of convex bodies, which should help us to distinguish between a position and the shape of the body at this position. So a center function is nothing else but a map from convex bodies, say, to points, which commutes with the isometry group. So CH of OK is the same as rho CH of K, for all K and rho. And now we can take, uh, consider for a given for L set B um, in hyperbolic space of volume one, and the measure of all bodies which have the centers in B, and this is called the intensity if it's finite. So this assumption implies that this is finite, but the following theorem holds actually under the weak assumption that gamma is finite. So here's the first result which states if lambda is isometry invariant, then I can decompose lambda into um, a shape information which is provided by a probability measure Q on convex bodies, which are centered, meaning this measure Q is concentrated at the convex bodies which have the center at a pre-assigned point, P, the origin, and uh, some positional information. But this is now harder in the hyperbolic space, and therefore we decompose here not with respect to translations as, now, as in Euclidean space, but we apply here the Haar measure on the isometry group and get here rho applied to this shape um, G. So this decomposition always holds, and actually it's unique. So Q is unique, that's the main point. If we require Q to be concentrated on these um, centers, which is natural, and invariant under all isometries fixing the origin. Then um, Q is actually uniquely determined, and since it's uniquely determined by these properties, um, it's justified to call a random um, convex body having this distribution typical um, particle. Because that's somehow you look randomly choose a particle, if you could, and move it to the origin, and then this is the typical particle. You can't do this because they're infinitely many and you cannot select but that's a, a way of formalizing this, and there are other ways um, to describe it. Uh, from the proof, you also get that um, some, the local finiteness here implies that the volume of a one parallel set of the typical particle has finite mean value. That's a technical thing which will be used and not mentioned afterwards. So I did the comparison with the Euclidean um, space um, on the way. Okay, um, now if we study formulas like um, variances in, U in Euclidean space, and that had been done um, in, the, in the recent work, then you encounter a functional, um, which is the covariogram function, which is to the convexity people in this group uh, very well known, just for its own geometric interest. And uh, quite naturally, it pops up in studying variances. Um, of the volume function uh, of Boolean models. So let's first define uh, the mean volume of the typical particle just by d sub d. This will be used um, uh, in formulas below. And then we define the mean covariate gram function of the typical ring, which is the following. So g is the random convex polytope, a uh, convex body having distribution q. And then for two points x and z in space, is look at all um, isometries such that rho x and rho z fall into g. Then we take them 
measure of all such isometries and the mean. The mean is with respect to this random mean. The Euclidean counterpart of this would be the volume of the intersection of G and the translate of G, and, and then taking the mean. So here, formally, um, the second point is the origin, but usually you forget about that, because it's shift invariant, as this is invariant if you apply the same isometry to X and Z. So there's no natural way, as far as I can see, to avoid the use of the isometries in hyperbolic space. And here's um, where the, these um, objects um, show up. So here, that's a summary of some results from our paper. Um, the first is, is quite easy. It just says, if you look at the Boolean model inside an observation window and take its volume, then the mean value of this intersection volume is just the volume of, of the observation window times some factor, which is smaller than one, and involves the mean value information of the typical grain. And that's a kind of relation, the simplest of, a, of several, which you are hoping for, because that's the quantity you can observe on the picture. And that's a quantity you can't observe because it's a typical grain. And here, from this mean value relation, if you invert it, you can um, define estimators of the volume of G. It might be harder to get, um, um, say, unbiased estimators, and there's a lot of techniques by people in spatial statistics to get that, but that's one such relation you, you are hoping for. That's the second one, um, and actually it looks the same in Euclidean space. Here's another relation which looks the same in Euclidean space, namely for the, the essentially the surface area of the intersection of Z with V, taking the mean value. Now here you have the volume of the observation window, you have the corresponding information here with the volume replaced to the surface area of the typical grain and its mean value. The VD is here. Here you get the surface area of the observation window and again um, this VD. Now looking at that and seeing that this quantity is observable, you can invert, because this has already been um, identified through this relation, you can now um, get Vd minus 1, which is the next um, information about um, the typical grain, at least on the level of mean values. And in Euclidean space, you get a triangular array of um, intrinsic volumes of um, mean values of the typical grain, uh, which are expressed by corresponding mean values from the Boolean model. And this is the, what usually is called the Miles and Davy formulas. And what we found also in hyperbolic space um, are corresponding relations which are more involved. And um, the reason is the following. If you um, pass to limits, take divide by the volume of the observation window, and let the observation window expand, say take a ball of radius r and let r go to infinity, then this limit uh, is not an actual limit, it's a constant, it's equal to this. That's easy. Now let's look at this one. If you divide by the volume, the volume cancels here, so you get this, and you divide the surface area of the observation loop by the volume, which doesn't go to zero as in Euclidean space and survives in the limit with a factor d minus one there. So this is the first occurrence of a formula which is different in hyperbolic space because something survives in the limit which disappears in Euclidean space. And there's several effects of this type um, which, which have to, take in, to be taken into account. So that's um, just an indication of mean value formulas. And the simplest variance formula is seen here. So for variances, it's natural that you need second order uh, assumptions like the second moment is finite of the typical grain. And then you can, and we can show, could show that the variance of the volume of the Boolean model in the observation window divided um, has a limit, which can be seen here. So it's an integral over all points of hyperbolic space with respect to the volume measure. Um, here, the mean Cobayo gram function of the, um, of the typical grain is shown. And in Euclidean space, this factor is not there. That's again something which is new in hyperbolic space, and what you can see here is it's the probability that the point Z lies into in a hollow ball, which is determined by the parameters u and t. U is the direction 
namely uniformly chosen on the units here in the tangent space of the hyperbolic space. And t or minus t is an exponentially distributed random variable. So here, this probability of set lying in a hour ball of this type um, is a new feature um, of hyperbolic space, not available in hyperbolic space. So here, um, you can have a visual impression of the two formulas. That's the one in, uh, in Euclidean space, where this factor is not there. And that's how the Boolean model might look like in a Euclidean space in an observation window. Here's the observation window on the hyperbolic Boolean model. And um, what I pointed out is that these boundary effects, namely um, that you have balls on the boundary, which contribute to the variance, um, their um, measure, intensity measure, is proportional to the surface area of the, of the ball, which um, scales like r to the d minus 1 in Euclidean space and as compared to the volume that's of lower order. But in hyperbolic space, you can also get visually that there are more of these balls and their um, measure has the same order as the volume. And therefore, um, something like that shows up. It's not clear at all that the limit exists, but that's um, a part of the proof and the business. So, um, I mentioned volume and surface area, but that's not the only functionals you, you hope for. Um, and um, fortunately, you can start quite um, axiomatically and say what kind of functionals with which properties you want to study, and then prove results um, for um, all kinds of geometric functions having these properties. Well, that's part of the business. So let's, sorry, it was too fast, let RD denote the convex ring. <laughs> And um, take unions of finitely many convex, which are finite, unions of finitely many convex sets. And a map phi from Rd um, to the reals is called measurable in the usual sense. It's sufficient actually that it's measurable on convex sets, then measurability on Rd follows. You have the activity requirement, you have the isometry invariance requirement, and we say uh, phi is locally bounded if. Uh, phi of k taking the soup of all bodies k which lie in a ball of radius uh, 1, say, um, is finite. And if you have isometry invariance, this simplifies and um, sometimes one uses also continuity on kd. So, geometric means you have these four properties um, and then there's continuity. And um, examples of functions having all these properties are the coefficients of a, of a Steiner, form, uh, Steiner formula in hyperbolic space or the Euler characteristic, which is not V0 in hyperbolic space. It's different. Okay, um, you saw this probability in popping up in the variance um, that set is contained in a horror ball. And actually, we need a measure, an isometry invariant measure on the space of horror balls. And that's a natural parameterization of this measure. It's obtained by integrating over all unit vectors in the tangent uh, space, in the unit sphere of the tangent space of hyperbolic space, and an integral over R with this density, and then you have B U T in dot and do the integration. And with this normalization, um, this corresponds to what we have seen before. And that's an isometry invariant measure. That's what I can check, and um, Gil Solans and Eduardo Gallego did this already. So here is um, a general fact about the existence of um, asymptotic mean values. So if you have any geometric functional, so just by the properties um, you have seen before, take um, the Boolean model in an observation window or with radius r, apply phi, take the mean value, and divide by the volume, then this li limit exists and can be expressed by an infinite series involving integrations over Hopper balls, over the typical grain, and over the intensity measure. And having chosen these n minus 1 bodies and the typical grain and the Hopper ball, you do the intersection of all of these applied to phi, 
and the alternating sum gives the, um, gives the mean value. This is a bit intimidating, um, you might think, uh, but um, it's already amazing that the limit always exists, just having um, basic information about phi. If you specify phi to the volume or surface area or specific functions, you can identify the limit and simplify it to maybe finitely many sums. You can also, for specific functions, try a direct approach, um, as in the volume, then it's trivial. In the surface area, it's maybe easy, but in general, um, that's the, the best you can do. And um, um, amazingly, such a formula in Euclidean space is not in the literature. It's implicitly contained in a paper by um, Linda Last and Matthias Schulter and myself from 2016, but in the corresponding formula just doesn't involve this additional integration over the power boys. Okay. So here we pass to the limit, and that's why we have continuity and have to require continuity. That's due to this integration here. If we want to have the mean value just in a finite observation window, then we can do just with these in assumptions and still get a series expansion. And something similar but much harder to attain is um, for the variance, asymptotic variances. I will be brief here. So we can again show that the, the limit of the, the asymptotic variance exists if you take balls and write down an explicit expression. Now not um, with alternating signs, fortunately, um, because this should be non-negative at least, uh, with integrations over hoverboards, the typical grain, and um, these intensity features. And again, if, if phi is the volume or surface area, um, and for all the intrinsic volumes, one should be able to get much neater expressions. We did it for the volume and the surface area, and our, work, our approach works also for the others, but it's already very hard in Euclidean space. So in Euclidean space, we did this um, to some extent, but in hyperbolic space, we'll much more um, demand it. Um, what is interesting, and I will be very brief here, um, is that you can only cover um, variances, but also covariances. You can, for instance, take the covariance of the volume in the surface area and study its um, local um, behavior, so in the observation window, or in the asymptotic behavior, if you plug in a ball, if you use R, divide by the volume, and let R go to infinity. And here, um, expressions show up um, which, which are, um, have the counterparts um, in Euclidean space, but usually, um, as you see here in the asymptotic uh, world, additional integrations over um, the invariant measure of hover balls shows up, and this sum is not um, there at all. And you see the factor d minus 1, which indicates there was a ratio of surface area and, bound and volume, which goes to zero in the Euclidean setting. Here it survives, and it's very hard to identify um, the constant, this factor here. So this is... Um, is a natural um, request for uh, starting standard limit theorem that you understand asymptotic variances, or at least lower bounds for, for the variances. Um, so uh, now we are ready for, for that topic, standard limit theorems. So what we can show is for any geometric functional, we don't need continuity here. Knowing that um, the ratio of the variance and the volume has a positive limb inf, we get a central limit theorem um, for, the, for the normalized functionals phi in a ball of radius r as, um, as um, r goes to infinity. And our second bound assumption, this goes to a normal distributed random variable. If we um, assume um, more moments, finite moments, and then we get convergence in the Kolmogorov uh, metric actually with a speed of convergence. So that's an estimate which not only holds as r goes to infinity, but for each r. And you can imagine that the, the usual techniques you, you, um, which have been established in the last decades to, um, to people I mentioned before, like Giovanni, like Matthias, and Matthias, and Günther, and um, uh, 
uh, vacuum panels and uh, many more, first off. So um, maybe you miss a um, um, statement in between for the Wasserstein distance. Um, actually, there, there is such a result. If you assume finite third moments, then um, you get convergence. You get such an estimate for the Wasserstein distance. Um, here is a nice result which ensures that the hypothesis of the central limit theorem is actually satisfied. That was this request. And under a very weak um, assumption, which you can see here, um, and this is ensured for any geometric functional. And to see that this is very general, just take the trivial situation where m is equal to zero. Then this means phi um, of uh, g is non zero with positive probability with respect to q. And for any reasonable function and situation, this should be satisfied. Okay, um, there are um, some. Um, comments which I might add concerning proof strategies. So we can benefit from results concerning the central limit theorems, um, which have been established in the Deegan space. And here are some of these works. Actually, um, in the Deegan space, um, one more step has already been taken, passing from compact particles to maybe unbounded ones like cylinders, um, which is um, um, maybe different problems, and this is not done for the hyperbolic space because for the cylinder is an hyperbolic space is not so clear. Um, of course, one needs the, the, as I said, the asymptotic formulas for the mean values and the variances in their careful study. And in comparison, for instance, to our 2016 work um, due to recent developments in central limit theory, we could improve some moment assumptions. So I skip that, um, but maybe take the chance to indicate just on this final slide um, that there are also various results from integral geometry which had to be established anew. And here is just, just one which shows that um, and how um, <coughs> all balls are involved. So let's uh, say you have function phi on un the union of convex bodies and horror bodies. It should be defined on both of them, which is bounded and measurable. And this phi should be continuous <coughs> if the limit is a horror ball uh, with parameter ut, in the sense that the approximating sequence of balls um, converges. That's a very weak assumption. And should only hold for almost all u and t, not for all. That's and we require phi and to be zero if the set K doesn't intersect for all of radius R0. And then we can show that the limit of phi evaluated at ball of radius x with x average to <coughs> all space divided by the ball <coughs> converges, and the limit is the measure of phi evaluated at horror balls integrated against the invariant measure mu h b. So that's a, a key tool, and this key tool has several other integral geometric consequences. Here is one. Um, maybe um, I'm cheating. Uh, and here's another one. Um, um, I only want to indicate, usually we have for integral geometric formulas just one function and you average. Here we need to cope with products of functions or powers. And that's, that's completely different stuff. Okay, I stop at that point.